ready to start. Um, um, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, um, as um, you probably know, here we are with a new pre-event of our 18 international conference, the Komomo Conference and Students Workshop uh, that will be held in Santiago, in Chile, in December 2024. And uh, today we have two um, guests. Uh, one is a group uh, from uh, Uruguay and and from Brazil. Um, we are going to start with the first presentation, which is about the uh, Columbarium uh, Absolute Limit, the Municipal Columbarium of Nelson Bayarda, uh, Bayardo in Montevideo, Uruguay. And the speakers are Juan Jose Fontana, who is in charge, and Jorge Gambini, Mary Mendes, and Fernando Tomeo, from the University uh, Universidad de la República, uh, the University in Montevideo, Uruguay. And second, we have uh, four, uh, four uh, plus uh, 1961, uh, Villanova Artigas and contemporaries, uh, and the speaker is Ruth Verdesein from the um, um, Presbyterian uh, Mackenzie University in Sao Paulo. Uh, so we want to start with uh, uh, Juan Jose Fontana. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you, the the presenters. And as you know, we are at uh, the YouTube channel of the uh, Heritage Center of the Catholic University at the same time. So we can start with uh, uh, Juan Jose. Uh, Juan Jose, go ahead uh, with your presentation. Thank you again. And thank you. Thank you, Horacio. Well, good morning to everyone. My name is Juan Jose Fontana, and the title of this presentation is Absolute Limit the Municipal Columbarium of Nelson Bayardo in Montevideo, Uruguay. During 1959, architect Nelson Bayardo designed a building to house funerary urns with the collaboration of Jose Pedro Titze. The building constructed between 1960 and 1961 has an exposed reinforced concrete structure and a large scale mural by artist Edwin Studer that was completed in 1962. In the Columbarium, we can see the main architectural discussions of the time, such as the sculptural valuation of the load bearing system and the respect for the constructive qualities of materials. There is a search for integration of the arts, an obsession with geometry and a vision of architecture as a collective work. The relationship of the building with its landscaped surroundings highlights a carefully studied implantation. Its design reflects risky decisions for the time. It is an elevated building with large spans and exposed concrete. These decisions imply the need for a very neat finish without the possibility of hiding errors or inaccuracies in the execution. The building was recognized in local and foreign publications such as the Argentine magazine Suma, the French magazine L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, and, and as cited by historians and critics such as Artusio, Bullrich, or Brown. The image of the building has been preserved through photographs taken and published in its early years. However, in more recent years, it has deteriorated mainly due to its poor maintenance. Here is a photograph of the recently inaugurated, inaugurated building in 1961. And during the 1990s, it underwent functional modifications. 
The paved surface on the ground floor was increased. An iron perimeter fence was installed to increase the number of urns stored. An adjoining room made of concrete blocks was added and several of its exposed concrete surface, surfaces was, were painted. Fortunately, most of these modifications have now been reversed. The artistic values of the building determine its designation as a National Historical Monument in 2014, as well as its incorporation in the exhibition Latin America in Construction, held at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2015. From these two events, a renewed interest in the building arose. In 2013, professors Gambini, Mendes, and Tomeo inspected the building and noted the presence of signs of deterioration, such as spalling, fissures, cracks, exposed reinforcement bars, stains, and so on. At that time, they made a first technical report on its state of conservation. In 2018, during a new visit, they noted a notorious worsening on the conditions of the building in, relations, in relation to that recorded five years earlier. And then they alerted the dean, the authorities involved in, the, in its conservation. A report was submitted to the dean of the Faculty of Architecture to the Heritage Protection Unit of the Municipality of Montevideo and to the National Commission for Cultural Heritage. Faced with the risk of losing one of the main works of the modern national heritage, it was proposed to carry out a recovery and management plan for the building through an agreement between the Faculty of Architecture and the Municipality of Montevideo. The agreement was signed in 2019 and a multidisciplinary team of teachers was formed with the advice of a specialized group from the University of Sao Paulo. All the members of the team are listed here in the slide. The main objectives of the agreement were to get to know the building comprehensively and to integrate this knowledge to teaching and in, in academic research to survey its current state of conservation and to establish guidelines for the recovery and maintenance of the building. The final report was presented in 2022. Several publications have been published on the work carried out during the research, congresses, seminars, meetings, and magazines. And a few months ago, the book Absolute Limit was published. The methodology developed for the research included the search for documents, historical contextualization, physical recording of the building, its description and formal analysis, recording of damages, tests, study of structural behavior, diagnosis, anticipation of preventive and curative actions, a recovery and repair project, and a management plan. In relation to the search for documents, we tracked down information on the construction of the building and on the team of technicians who were involved. The building was placed in its specific context and in that of the general production of its authors. A network of municipal technicians involved in these activities was assembled. Contact was established with the families of these technicians who provided us with information and documents. These families were interviewed. And finally, Nelson Bayardo's family donated the architect's private archive to the Faculty of Architecture, and it was placed in the documentation center of the Institute of History. The constructed building was surveyed. Blueprints were drawn from in two and three dimensions and analysis photographs were taken. A three-dimensional model was made to update the project to the, finally, to the building finally constructed. In this way, the small alterations that the project underwent during its construction and use were highlighted. 
the original two dimensional blueprints were redrawn from the three dimensional model. Photography was used as a tool for analysis of the implementation of the building and of the relationship with its surroundings. A comparative study of the photographs from different periods was made. And finally, an essay was written about the complex experience of using the building. Here we can see some images of the new blueprints of the building, the redrawing of the location plan, the redrawing of the first floor, the mezzanine, some details of the mezzanine plan, the roof on the left and the ground plan in, in, the, in the right, a section in the north wing, The main objectives of the registration of the building and its constructive configuration were to determine the characteristics of its materials and components. A structural model was made in order to determine its performance and to know its deformation, stresses and cracking widths. In the following slides, I will present some of the results obtained in this stage, which have as reference the, star, the, the standards mentioned in this image. Measurements were taken with manual instruments and tests were carried out for the physical and mechanical characterization of the materials. For this, it was necessary to extract specimens and the criterion of the minimum affectation of the building was followed given its patrimonial character. The physical configuration of the building is composed of different systems and components as follows in the next slides. The foundation devices consist of simple spread footing resting on a hard clay soil, foundation beams and retaining walls. Here we can see the original blueprint of foundations. There are 14 simple spread footings Eight of them are located under the exterior facades, two under the open work pillars, and uh, four under the wall that supports the mural. And down here, we can see the table with the indication of the dimensions and steel reinforcement of the footing. Here we have a view of the inner courtyard where we can see some of the retaining walls down here. On the other hand, we have the vertical structure composed by pillars and walls. The horizontal structure is composed by ribbed slabs with internal wooden formwork. The external facades are formed by pillars and high beams. The internal facades are formed by pillars and beams that serves as railings or parapets. Here we can see the north facade with four windows and the two gargoyles. The other three facades, the east, west and south facades are completely black, completely blind. The north and the east facades in, in this photograph the structure of, of the facades, up here the north facade, the east and the west facades, and then and the south facade. Here is a close view of the north facade. Internal facade at the west wing, the internal facade at the north wing. Here is the first floor plan with the real reinforcements, with the indication of the reinforcements, the, the stairs that lead to the mezzanine. And here is, here is the plan of the mezzanine. And here we can see photographs with normal camera and thermographic camera, which allowed us to confirm the existence of the internal reinforcement ribs in the slabs. Down here are 
photographs with normal camera and up here uh, the same view with thermographical camera. An inspection in one of the ribs labs revealed that the internal formwork are made of timber. Here we can see a, a detail of the inspection. Original roof blueprint with skylights. The, the, the little skylights in the north wing and, and the large ones in the south wing. The original blueprint with pillar reinforcement. Here is a photograph of the north wing, the roof at the west wing, and the roof at the north wing. Here we can see the original texture of the concrete in an area that has not suffered deterioration. This is the north wing at the ground level. And this is an open work pillar. The roof is formed by ribbed slabs with skylights in the north and south wings, composed of glazed panels on metal structures. The urn shells are formed by vertical partitions and five centimeters thick slabs. Some are attached to the external facades and others are freestanding. The circulations consist of five circulatory cords. Two of them connect the first floor with the courtyard and two others connect the first floor with the mezzanine. The main access is a staircase cantilevered from a wall with a variable section between 10 and 18 centimeters. And there is also a grating at the top of the main staircase, which is not part of the original project. Here we can see the roof, which has had almost no maintenance since its construction. Here is a close view of the tiling of the roof. The skylights in the north wing. The skylights in the south wing, the large ones. This is the roof of the, of the east wing. A detail of one of the shelves attached to an external facade. Shelves attached to walls in the south wing and a freestanding one in the center. Shelves in the east wing. A detail of shelves in the mezzanine. Here we have shelves in the west wing. A photograph of the west wing from the mezzanine. A top view of the main, main staircase. The skylights in the, in the south wing. And here we have the metal grading, which is obviously not part of the original pro project. No? It, it, it's what we call an improper addition. Regarding the pavements on the first floor, second floor, and mezzanine, concrete screeds are observed on the slabs. On the first floor and courtyard, the screeds are on the ground. Regarding the sanitary installation, there is only one water supply point on the ground floor. The rainwater drainage system consists of cast iron pipes embedded in pillars of, of the exterior facades. On the first floor, there are drainage outlets with direct discharge to the ground floor. And in the north facade, there are two gargoyles. There are also video cameras on parapets, which are not part of the original project. And finally, there is a mural by artist Edwin Studer attached to an, to an interior facade. It consists of, of a group of cantilever reinforced concrete volumes. This is the original sanitary installation blueprint.
Here are the drains over the facade pillars and a detail of the roof. Here are some images, the, the north facade with the two gargoyles. This is the interior facade at the south, at the south wing with the with the mural by Edwin Studer. And here we have some close views of, of the mural with with a detail of the concrete volumes. In relation to the pathology survey. Here is a list of the activities performed, the products obtained here, and here a list of the tests that we perform. Here we can see the damage mapping on the ground floor, the damage mapping at the first level sailing, the mapping at the first floor, the mapping at the mezzanine. Here's the east and west interior facade and the damage mapping at the north and south interior facades. And here at, at the external facades, the, the south and east facades. Here we can see the pachymeter, which allowed us to locate the reinforcement bars, the, the water permeability tests, the air permeability test, here is a sequence of photographs of the, of the extraction of a specimen from a beam. At the, east, at, at the east wing. And here are photographs of the surface hardness tests. Microscopic observation on the concrete aggregates. And here we have some results on, on the tests. Uh, electrical resistivity of concrete and depth of alkalinity loss in concrete. Here we, we have the four specimens that we is, is extracted from the building. X-ray diffraction results. And here we have the, the main results obtained. The chloride ion content uh, was not significant. The compressive strength of the specimens was about 35 megapascals. In several components, the depth of alkalinity loss of the concrete reaches the reinforcement bars, and the permeability of the surface concrete is poor to very poor. In order to analyze the performance of the structure and to obtain numerical approximation to its deformation, stresses, and cracking widths, a model was made with RFEM software. Here we can see some images of the model structure. Concrete C30. 37 was chosen with a characteristic compressive strength of 30 megapascals. And for the reinforcement bars, steel B420 was selected with a characteristic yield stress of 420 megapascals. Permanent loads, overloads, according to Uruguayan Unit 33 standard, wind pressure, according to Uruguayan Unit 50 standard and earn overload were set in the model. The structural calculations were performed in accordance to Eurocode 2. 
Here are some of the results obtained in the model. The maximum deformations occur in the beams at the roof level, beams uh, with a span of 15 meters, which drag the slabs. Here we have deformations at the, at the external facades, the north facade and the south facade. Here we can see deformations in the interior facade of the north wing. Uh, I think your slides are not uh, going ahead. Huh? Sorry, Juan Jose. Which slide are, are you watching? We are watching the electrical resistivity of concrete. The test results. Oh, here. Yeah. Okay. Now you 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 are. It's passing. Oh, well, mm -hmm. I stop sharing the screen. Yeah. And I will yes. share again. That was the last slide that, that you saw. Yes. Yes, yes this is the last one. Yeah. Okay. And now you 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 are watching the, the next yes. slide. Okay. Well I I go back a little. Uh, here we have the four specimens uh, extracted from the building. Uh, I was saying the X-ray diffraction results. And here the main results of the test, the, uh, the chloride ion content, the resistivity, the, the, the resistance of the specimens, 35 megapascals, and the resistance of the surface um, concrete that was bad to very bad. And here uh, are the, the some images of the model, the structural model with RFEM software. This is the, the geometric model that for the structural search. Well, the loads, well, I, I told the, the permanent loads, earn loads, uh, wind pressure. And here we have uh, uh, deformation graphs. This is the, the, the deformations of all, all the model. The, the maximums were in the roof, 15 meter span beams that which drag the uh, the slabs on the roof. These are the deformation um, graphs of the external facades, the north facade and the south facade. the deformation graphs of the internal facades. Deformation of the interior facade of the west wing and the internal facade of the east wing. Here we can see the deformation in some slabs, the roof slabs and the mezzanine slab. Here we see the deformation in the first floor slabs, the maximum values occur here in the north wing. And here we see graphs of compressive stresses in exterior, in external and internal facades. The compressive stress values do not exceed in any case the strength values obtained in specimens tests. Here we can see the cracking widths which were compared with the cracks found in the building. Cracks in the north facade, in, in, in the inner facade at the north wing, the interior facade of the west wing. And here we can see the cracking width, uh, sorry, the, the, the minimum steel reinforcement required according to the model. 
Some conclusions from the structural model. The bottom steel reinforcement in the slab's ribs is 3% higher than the steel required according to the model. On the exterior facades, the steel mesh 8 mm bars every 15 cm is less than the reinforcement required according to the structural model. The reinforcement on both sides of the columns has 60% more steel than the minimum required according to the structural model. The final balance, we could say that the building shows signs of damage, especially to its horizontal structural elements, the slabs, and to a lesser extent to its vertical ones, the beams and the pillars. Under current conditions, these deficiencies do not compromise the overall stability of the building. However, given the progressive nature of the pathological processes detected linked to the loss of alkalinity and the high permeability of the surface concrete, such as spalling, corrosion, and loss of reinforcement section, it is foreseeable that in the short term, the performance of some structural parts may be compromised. The significant functional deficiencies of the waterproofing layer protecting the slabs especially on the roof, are direct causes of the damages suffered by the building. Therefore, it is considered urgent to prevent rain, rainwater from entering the building. From an expressive and formal point of view, the generalized alterations to the exposed concrete surface represent a substantial variation from the original image of the building. These factors added to the incorporation of improper additions and, then, and the disappearance of some components such as the shelf doors modified the special proposal and the character of the building and we think that they should be reversed. The project of the enhancement of the structure prioritizes three aspects. It is consider that the pathologies associated with reinforcement corrosion are a consequence of carbonation and the high permeability of the concrete surface. It is necessary that the repair system foresees the application of corrosion inhibitors and a compatible water repellent surface finish in order to prevent the appearance of new pathologies. And finally, the texture, color, and geometric pattern of the exposed concrete surface are part of the heritage attributes of the building. For this reason, the modulation and surface finish of the repairs must be compatible with its original image. It is therefore essential to carry out texture and color studies in those areas where it is necessary to replace material as well as repair tests in order to design procedures that ensure an adequate aesthetic integration. Well, and that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Juan Jose. It's a really amazing uh, work uh, with uh, all these um, uh, layers. Uh, taking account of the structural and the reinforced concrete uh, situation and also the the colonies the biological colonies in the surface which is really an amazing work an entire diagnosis of a building we have not uh, yet uh, some presentation like that thank you so much for that now i'm i'm asking if 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 someone has a a uh, very direct uh, question, uh, can do it now. If not, we can uh, go ahead with the presentation of Ruth and then take a, a few minutes to to questions and comments. Oh, so Ruth, Ruth uh, as I said, Ruth Berdesign, she is professor of very well-known critic of architecture and is an architectural historian. She is professor from the um, Mackenzie Presbyterian University in Sao Paulo. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. I'll share my presentation. Um, every, everybody seeing? Yes. Yes. Okay.
So I'm going to read because it's better. Um, I would like to thank uh, Horacio Torrent and the organizers of the 18th International Docomo Conference for the invitation to participate in this pre-event. It's an honor, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. In 2015, we celebrated the centenary of Brazilian architect João Batista Villanova Artigas. At that moment, I proposed to my undergraduate students to organize a timeline including his works in parallel with the architectural works from Sao Paulo, from Brazil, Latin America, and the world. These are the diagrams the students made, the buildings, were organized by their date of design during the time, the, the, the period of Artigas' professional uh, life. The idea was to stimulate them to open to the possibility of understanding architectural facts through the context, complex relationships that each work establishes vertically with the contemporary ones and horizontally with the others that preceded it and, and how they may have inspired of other pieces of architectures that followed in time, even to the contemporaneity. In other words, uh, to understand each work, not by stylistic definitions or by hierarchical canonizations, but as creative expressions of architectural disciplinary culture. For today's presentation, I selected a piece of vertical sec section from the early 1960s decade. This is a graph I did in my doctoral thesis in 2005, uh, doing the same thing, um, putting a side by side uh, uh, Sao Paulo works with Brazilian and international works. Uh, in 1961, Artigas designed one of his most famous buildings, the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism of the University of Sao Paulo, where, um, by the way, I studied. It was a especially fruitful moment in Artigas' architectural production or, and for modern architecture in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Latin America, and all over the world, uh, everywhere. Um, after the completion of my doctoral thesis, in 2005, I expanded the scope of my research to include all the so-called brutalist works designed and built anywhere on the planet. Naturally, such a broad scope, it's an impossible goal, but I keep trying it. The accumulated data suggests that the cusp of the 1960s marks an exponential increase of brutalist works all over the world, and we have just seen uh, another beautiful example uh, of that in the previous presentation. My assumptions were further corroborated after 2017, when powerful and better funded institutions, as for example, the Frankfurt Architectural Museum, organized a similar survey. So for today, among dozens of other significant examples, I selected a very limited sample of the modern architectures and so-called brutalist works to present to you. Four buildings, all of them designed in 1961 or 1962, all located on the American continent, all with common traits, and of course, with many differences, almost like a family. These buildings are the, the the Faust building that you have here on the upper left, designed by Artigas and his partner Cascaldi. The Boston City Halls, designed by Calmo, McKinney, and Knowles. The Cepal uh, building in Santiago de Chile uh, by Duarte, de Grote, Gorcolea, and Santelices. And the National Library by Testa, Bullrich, and Casaniga. Here, they are shown at approximately the same scale in recent aerial photos. The maps are oriented northwards. 
Three of them are aligned with the north-south with a slightly 15 degree kind of variation, except for the library, which is rotated 45 degrees to take advantage of the Rio de la Plata views. When Palladio describes the Villa Rotonda, he says that, uh, uh, and I quote, the building stands on a hill and enjoy magnificent views, end quote. The healing emplacement occurs in three of the buildings, except for the sepal that is placed in a valley. The magnificent views describe all four experiences. These four buildings all both enjoy and are the focus of the views. Heraus, Hinain, to see, to be seen, all of them have a central courtyard focus, each case in a different manner. They are not buildings designed to mildly fit in their sites, but to define and create a new place, an event, a happening, a core. So this is the Boston City Hall and the views and the entrance and the core. And the National Library and the views to the Rio de la Plata and the Palermo and the park below. The Cepal, the looking and of the views in Santiago. And the FAUSP, which is the least uh, preoccupied with the views, but still, they, they are there. Perhaps it's worth mentioning the three reminders to architects proposed by Le Corbusier in Vers une architecture, where he says that his only master was the past. And here, and where he's, uh, he breaks with academicism without breaking with the Vitruvian, Albertian, Renaissance, Palladian traditions, whose proportional rules he tries to recuperate and systematize a few decades later in his modular proposal. The desire to reconcile opposites that animated Le Corbusier's endeavor was denounced by Villanova Artigas in one of his most famous militant political texts written a decade before designing the Faust building. A test where he abjured modular with a sincere heart and unfeigned faith, the test in all the sorts of deceptions and heresies. Yet in his buildings, he follows the traditions. Like Brecht's Galileo Galilei, Artigas can help but mutter that earth rotates e por si move. As it happens with Artigas, the harmony of proportions was a device still in use in all those moderns, and it was also used in all those modern architects' toolboxes. They respond to the search for a new monumentality that abjures the past but understands the present. Their ideas fitted very well in that happy moment in the middle of the 20th century, when architects wanted to play and governmental clients like good nannies let them play. In these buildings, there occurs an integration of opposites. Horizontality gives them extension and supports the proposition of grandiose megastructures. Like here you can see the, the ground floor of each of the buildings and the scale with a hundred meter scale to compare them. They are quite quite similar in, in, in dimensions. In his in their books about uh, uh, heroic Boston, uh, Mark Pasnick, Michelle Kubos and Chris Grimley, they say uh, some words about the boss and they, they, they did an inter a very interesting interview with the authors, etc. They never used the name brutalist. I, I asked them why they said, well, because the it, brutalist by that moment in the beginning of the uh, of this millennium was still a bad word, but it's not anymore. But anyway, 
uh, and he, they say the Boston became the uh, a, a laboratory for this architect to examine the materials, the structural and sculptural qualities in reshaping the public realm, symbolizing a progressive civic vision through monumentality and robust architectural expression, reflecting the dramatic scale of urban change in cities throughout the country. And they are speaking about the United States, but we can extrapolate to everywhere. The built uh, results uh, of these efforts became out icons of an international movement whose value and meaning continue to resonate in the cultural landscape of today." End quote. And here the uh, uh, human scale and in Gothic proportions of in the National Library in Buenos Aires. And here, the most like, horizontal, the least monumental, the most secluded, the emptiest, but not quite, Sepal. And the foul building. That do, that would deserve a, a, another presentation just for it for the, for that, but that's not what I'm going to do today. Voids and masses. According to Le Corbusier, again, architecture is the wise, correct, and magnificent play of volumes under the light. And that also happens in all these buildings that are full of magnificent details and volumes and light in the play of light and shadows. And here I chose this photo to show this idea of a civic space, uh, which is very evident in this in this case. This was before the restoration, this photo. Materiality from classical to modern to brutalist modern. Uh, there is, it's interesting because some people uh, still today, they don't really know how to classify this 1960s buildings because they are they modern, I are not they modern. In my point of view, uh, there is of course a change in materiality and a change of heart from this elegant light toothpick columns where the structure acts as a substrate that it's not so evident that it Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's frozen for everyone. Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. I think she's coming back in a few minutes. Eh? Yeah, yes, she's coming. She's coming back. So we can prepare some questions or, or comments for the for the next few minutes. Hey, here we are. I'm I'm really sorry. Are you hearing me? 
Yes, yes. I'm sorry, but, but yeah. you, as I said, that, that's what's happening in Sao Paulo right now. Where do I stop? Did I stop? Uh, Here? No. 29? Uh, that, that one, yes. That one? Okay. Yeah. So it's full full screen now, right? Yeah, it so is. So I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the 29 and keep on. Um, materiality from classical to modern to brutalist modern. Times were changing, structures and materi materiality were changing. After experimenting with lightness and transparency, modern architecture was experimenting with heaviness and opacity. And it's for me, it's very clear it's modern architecture yet, but maybe it's it, it needs to be said to be to say that. So some details of this expressionist uh, materiality in all of these buildings, which it was very difficult to, to choose because there are so many interesting details, sometimes preposterous details, but anyway, I, they are beautiful. And perhaps the least detailed is the, the faculty of Artigas, which is more but it's still, you can find so many uh, interesting ways of organizing the space there too. Here, I, I'm quoting Artigas. The artist is not influenced. He lives with, I think it's a wonderful definition. As my final thoughts, I'd like to quote a brief excerpt from my article, out of tune, out of order, or the more Artigas, the better, that was also published during Artigas centenary in 2015. But after I had visited the MoMA exhibition, Latin American in Construction, 1959-1980, also held on that year. So I'm quoting myself. Among the novelties presented in the MoMA's exhibition, one of the most significant Brazilian cases is, was that of the architect uh, João Batista Villanova Artigas. The international confirmation of Artigas as a born member of the not insignificant uh, list of excellent modern Brazilian architects came at least half a century late. The delay was unfair. While belated, varied, fruitful wave, a varied and fruitful wave of studies and research on the architect is now welcome, especially if it ignites a critical review of his work under the contemporary light of this other century, taking advantage of that time lag. We do not need to repeat outdated interpretations of simplified, low relief icons of another tropical myth. Such trivialized knowledge must be resisted. It needs to be faced head on. Foreign points of view from outside the boundaries that have so far circumscribed and limited the understanding of Artigas' work may help illuminate new facets or it may be used to blur its contours and cover it in shadows. Most likely, both situations will happen. I prefer to accept the possibility of debate and to encourage a diversity of approaches. You sow the seeds, you cultivate them, let them grow, and only then, when the fruit appears, you could lose those that are not of the right quality. Tolerance is cultivated for beginnings and rigor for conclusions, not the other way around. In any case, Villanova Artigas' immense talent will ever rest ev evident. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so very much fun. for this enl enlightenment presentation uh, about these four buildings in the same year and in the same 
um, what can I say, in the same box of the historical classification uh, that uh, it it's uh, very useful in these days about uh, brutalism. Um, if someone has a comment or a or a question, please go ahead. I I would like to thank you, the colleague Fontana for the presentation. It was really very interesting. I hope that all this care uh, would have been taken before making the, 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 the restoration of the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism. I, I, I really hope that was the case and happily it wasn't. So uh, we we have to live with the consequences. So thank you very much for your work. It's It's really an example of how to do things it's it was quite beautiful to see all that thank you well you're welcome we have the the, the advice of a, a specialized group of from the FAO from the USP you know, of Sao Paulo that, that had worked before with the Villanova Artigas building mm -hmm. yes uh, they, they the people from the, 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 the they keep it modern, but the keep it modern in Faus came after the yeah. uh, happy restoration. So this this the group that are working with you, um, and I I was kind of made occupied in this story somehow. Uh, uh, they are very very good people, very good uh, technic technicians, etc. But they they came afterwards to save what was possible to all the the things that had happened before. Yeah, we took advantage of, of the experience of the group uh, and the experience of the pre-restoration uh, that, that was not very successful. But um, uh, uh, And they told us uh, uh, the history of, 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 of that process. Uh, and yeah, it, it was very in, 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 line, in line enlightening for us. <laughs> well, uh, thank you both. I think it's uh, really impressive the work of uh, you have done in 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 uh, Montevideo uh, because of the of the high level te high high technician level uh, in in the case of of taking care uh, with this diagnosis from the structural points to the surfaces and uh probably most of of the of the damage are related with uh, with humidity and and the the um, uh, colonies uh, uh bi biological colonies in the surface which is uh, really impressive uh, when you see when when you show the the map uh these uh, plants with the with the uh, damages uh, in in relation everyone you know it's it's really really impressive I think it's a it's a paradigmatic case in in the South Cone of America uh, which is really nice to see and and have a comprehensive of the whole process also uh, and thank you Ruth because you put on 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 the table, the the main issue of this, uh, uh, um, what can I say? This period when when they they change the um, the column from the this uh, what can I say? Uh, this uh, uh, static um, of of the um, um, what what is the word as uh, uh, was was the not not to be heavy with the with the architecture to uh, just to represent the heaviness and and all the pieces came of the size to represent the the uh, heaviness of the construction and to show us the structure not in the in the case only uh, showing the regularity of the columns uh, just uh, behind the 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 um, crystals, or, or or just to change this. I think this this uh, slide with the relationship in between the system 
which is meant to be the Le Corbusier system in the idea of, of the pilotis and the and the uh, what what can I say the the volume made by safe surface to go ahead with the uh, volume made by mass and and with the huge uh, uh, as expression of the of the of the structural conditions. I think it's really the main the main issue we have here. Uh, because in in the in the case of the of the uh, columbarium is not very clear the structure is just the, the taking the same idea but the pieces the columns are not the heaviness uh, um, are not the, that heavy as as they they must be you know it's the the. The huge walls are are most important than the than the vertical uh, structure. I think it's that is one of the points because it's it's a box just um, uh, floating in in the in the um, in the in the landscape. It's a if comment. I, you know, yeah, if I may, all these four buildings I showed you are masses with light uh, with very uh, open down there even the column the foul will speak column our exterior column it sustains very little actually there is lots of columns inside so what is paradoxical in this brutalist architecture is that they are showing the structure but in fact they are not lying but they are over stressing some some details and the, the diagnostic they, they have done in the, the columbarium, it's interesting to see that actually it's another thing. You're quite, uh, plasticity is more important in this brutalist architecture than the truth of the materials and the truth of the structure, paradoxically. But that's it. It's never only about the truth of the structures. It's also about plasticity and the idea of openness below and heaviness above and this all these paradoxical things. So I think it's very interesting to 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 see. I would like to I, I thought in introducing the comparison with five buildings and introducing the columbarium when I first did this. But the, the proportions were it, it was very much more smaller. So I I, I kept on the, the things with the same proportion. But in a way, they are still in the, fa the same family. And, and another reason is that I haven't seen the, I haven't visited the Columbari, so I, I, I can't live my life anymore. So I have to go to Uruguay to see it because I can't live without that. And I only spoke about buildings I have visited. So that was another reason, sorry. Uh, thank you. So is any whenever you came well, you are welcome and let us know to to show you the that beautiful building thank you thank you another comment or questions Claudio Claudio hello hi Ruth <laughs> uh, wonderful presentations thank you very much uh, I, I have a question to Juan Jose uh, about the wonderful methodology that he showed us. Uh, are there another uh, experience in evaluation and restoration concrete buildings in Uruguay? No, I don't know uh, another uh, similar experiences. I don't know that we had to develop that methodology uh, based uh, on the advice of that uh, specialized Brazilian group. But uh, no, we, we hadn't uh, national reference uh, for, for, for that work, no. I think it's the first time that uh, we faced uh, um, this, the, a, a comp comprehensive study of a building uh, of concrete, exp of exposed concrete, then uh, yes, I, I think there is no um, precedence in, in, in your way. 
Thank you. And Ruth, uh, uh, we know that oh. the OSP receive a uh, restoration. There are another. Are there another experience there? Um, what happened is that after that they applied for the Keep It Modern program of the Getty Foundation, and they organized a group, a very very interesting group of very important professionals, young and more experienced people. And they made a very thorough study of the, 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 the building, et cetera, et cetera. So that in the next next phases that because restorations are like uh, in pictures, you have to restore every once in a while for every three or four decades, you have to restore it again. So they are accumulating knowledge in order to organize things not to be, uh, perhaps it was not all the faulty of the previous guys that went because it was very new. Not, nobody knew how to restore historical concrete. It, it doesn't even exist in this term, historical concrete, even. It was not like that. People are, are just restoring they restore the concrete as if they are restoring a bridge or a viaduct or something, which doesn't which doesn't matter if the color is the same in the end. It if you see the patches with the various gray, gray kinds of grays, so then we will say, well, well, this is absolutely important. You're not just restoring this structure; it's a historical feature of the structure. So now people are more aware. And this is worldwide too. Uh, no, nobody knew anywhere in the world uh, how to do that 10 years ago or 15 years ago. It's a working progress everywhere. Thank you. I don't know. Okay. Oh. No more questions or comments? Okay, so thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Juan Jose, and you on the whole team of the of the uh project on, of the Columbarium. And uh we can we hope uh, see you in, in December 2024 uh to have a, a very good presentation on both cases. Uh, on both uh, ideas of of the of the uh, relation with the with the Columbarium also and in our uh, conference we hope you can you can present some some uh, paper or, or or proposal and uh, we hope to see you in in a few in a few time uh, so thank you so much and thank you. Uh, for the audience, uh, remember that uh, all the pre-events are recorded also in the in the YouTube channel of the UZ uh, Heritage Center, Cultural Heritage Center. <clears throat> so you can see again there. Uh, thank you so much, and see you not not next Tuesday. We are ending this series of of pre-events on 28th of November, the last one uh, of our uh, pre-events related with conservation archives and, and uh, uh, representations. Uh, thank you so much. See you next Bye. time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.